as he comes up here, we're in a very unique position because it's not usual that we get a chance to spend a little time with the former chair of the Board of Environmental Protection because that person normally can't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but there's been a lot of comments about what happened and so forth, and, and, and my conversations with a good representative, he's agreed to come and share some of his thoughts, and I'm sure we'll be glad to answer your questions and, and uh, participate during our work session. So thank you, good representative, and welcome here. We've seen you in many capacities before in front of this board. And it's You'll good no doubt see me again. You know, I probably <laughs> will. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Senator Saviello, Representative Welsh, and the distinguished members of the Joint uh, Standing Committee on Environmental and Natural Resources. I am Robert Foley, and I proudly represent District 7, which is most of the town of Wells. Today, I am pleased to appear before you to share some of my insights based upon past experience and knowledge pertaining to the metallic mineral mining. In my previous life, prior to being elected to the legislature last November, I served on the Board of Environmental Protection and was its chair during the development of the Chapter 200 Metallic Mineral Exploration, Advanced Exploration and Mining Rules. Uh, I have been asked to appear here to present my perspective on the process of how the mining rule that is before you or coming before you was developed. Um, I do would like to acknowledge some of my compadres back there uh, who I haven't seen for a while and uh, I enjoy time with them. First, for those who do not know, the Board of Environmental Protection is a citizen's board made up of average main people who serve for no monetary remuneration but a desire to serve the residents of Maine in support of our environmental stewardship. At the time I served as the board's chair, we were seven individuals for various pr perspectives. A town manager, a geology professor, a former legislator, code enforcement officer, an environmental manager for a large industrial company, and an insurance guy with some municipal experience. I do not believe any of us were particularly supportive of Maine mi uh, mining in general. However, we took our role in the development of these rules in support of the law passed by the 125th legislature, and we were very serious. The board re received the rule developed by the department staff in late September of 2013. In early October, we held a day-long public hearing where some 90 people testified. After the public comment period, which ended in late October, the board received materials amounting to roughly 10,000 pages. We held many deliberative sessions throughout November and into December. We, along with the staff, worked through Thanksgiving, several weekends, and through Christmas of that year to try to get things right. And I'll tell you up front, the rule is not perfect, and I wish we had more time to have worked on them and further expanded upon certain areas of the rule. Nonetheless, no one should question the dedication of the board or the staff in the effort put forward. We tried our best under very difficult time constraints. Those who objected to the rule from the beginning will tell you that the process was flawed and that we did not listen or take into consideration the testimony that many gave against the rule. Those assumptions are incorrect. There were individuals who provided us with constructive analysis and submitted appropriate language to approve the rule. And we took all of those into consideration and made several adjustments to the rule as a result. Many simply asked us to reject the law and the rule outright without providing any constructive suggestions. Quite frankly, that was not our role in this process. The 125th legislature created the law that required the department and our board to come forward with a rule to support the implementation of the law. That is what our board does. The 126th legislature had the opportunity to amend, change, or reject what we had done, but our job was to bring something forward. When the rule came back last year, unfortunately, there was never any constructive dialogue about how to make improvements to the rule. And my hope, it is my hope that this committee will take that opportunity. You can improve on the work that's already been done, and if we are going to have metallic mineral mining in Maine, then we need to create a rule that is environmentally sound, while at the same time protecting what is important to all of us. That takes good, constructive dialogue, which is what I hope is beginning here. There are several issues that I wish we had time to revisit, and among them was, as Dr. Marvini just talked about, the wet cover perpetual treatment of waste rock. This was included at the, as a last resort in case some form of material <coughs> was uncovered during the mining process, and the best way to treat it would be to keep it underwater and to pre prevent any contamination. While the rule stated that this could only be done at, as a last resort, and only if it's the best method available for that type of material, we should have rejected it as an alternative. If something is that bad, simply put it back and cover it over. Allowing the second 
issue, allowing mining within a quarter mile of any state park or lands. This was placed in the rule to allow mining if there were a mountain or some other geological structure between the mining operation and the state land, and if there was sufficient and it was sufficient to provide protection from the mining operation. This stipulation should have remained at one mile, which was originally cited in the rule. We also struggle with the definition of limitations surrounding what is a mining area and mining operations. I suggest that the work the work needs to be done to better clarify where things are and what can happen where. While much has been questioned about the rule and its potential impact on groundwater and pollution, it is important to remember that the rule is in conjunction with all other environmental rules and regulations, both state and federal, such as the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, the Natural Resources Protection Act, and a host of other applicable laws that all must be followed. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about the process we went through. Go ahead, Representative DeShane. Thank you. I've been trying to uh, flesh out the confusion about the mining area, too, because I know <laughs> the committee had a lot of talk about it originally when we did this. Yeah. I think what originally came to us was the concept that mining is going to take place in this area, and it could be hundreds of acres, thousands of acres, whatever. This would be where all the mining activity happens. It's one area, and we'll test at the edge of it to see whether we're discharging. The committee kind of rejected that and said, no, uh, different activity is going to take place in different areas, and we're going to need to know and monitor those locations to know where the impacts are happening. So our understanding, I think, when the statute left this committee was that each one of these are mining areas and need to be monitored. Somehow there was a disconnect um, when it got to the board. Well, I think, I think the staff, uh, DEP staff, um, struggled with that as well. Um, and I think as... Dr. Marvity said, uh, each mining operation is going to take on its own character. Um, and it's really hard to define one mining site versus another mining site, depending on whether it's underground, open pit, or whatever it is. Uh, so it's really very, I think it's hard to, to come up with a set definition um, of what a mining operation and a mining area, and a, you know, it's going to really depend on what the operation is that's being planned or proposed. Um, so I'm not really sure you can come up with one that fits everybody, um, but it is, it's a tough one. It, it was difficult. We struggled with it. Um, staff struggled with it. Um, and I, I just, I don't know if there's a perfect answer to it, but I know that many people want to have that defined and people want to have certainty of where things are going to happen, where things are going to be monitored. Uh, and it just, it needs some work. Um, as you go forward, uh, that will be a, that will be something that will have to be uh, worked with. This, this really depends on the site. It really does. I mean, as we looked at, you know, we, and we talked to it with staff, it really dealt with, you know, what type of mining are you doing? You know, and, and everything would be, would be different based on, on that type of operation. I owe $5. Yeah. It's my daughter. Yes, it's my daughter. Go ahead. She, uh, go ahead, Rep um, Representative. Thanks. Um, so I'm just curious why you think that the um, stipulation should have remained at a mile. I'm just wondering what your thought process Well, originally the rule came to us um, with, at a mile. Um, and as we, as we worked through the rules, there were several points brought to our attention that if you had some state land on this side, but you had a large mountain, and, and there was going to be mining on this side of it, but that, that's a fairly good buffer between the state land and the mining operation. And if it was maybe a half mile, a quarter mile, you know, you, it might be safe to do so. Um, I'm not quite sure that that's true. Um, and so uh, as I think, look back at it and, and, and think for my own purpose, I would have rather have seen a state with a mile. Um, I think that gives significant buffer, um, and, I, and I'm not sure that uh, we, we would want to be any closer to public lands um, with a mining operation. Again, th these are my personal um, uh, feelings. Um, I, I no longer speak for the board, obviously, um, but I, I just give you my sense of as I went through it and, and as I sit here today thinking about it. I've got a question. I just want to make sure, and you and I have talked about this, but there were allegations that an individual or individuals hijacked the committee? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> I, I, uh, I think you could... Uh, 
people would tell you that I, I, I ran a pretty tight ship when I had the board, and, and no, I, I, we had open dialogue, very uh, uh, serious dialogue, and I, I welcomed all dialogue, but I don't think anybody hijacked anything um, in that, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to realize how, uh, you know, we had basically uh, two months to call through yeah. an enormous amount of information. Um, and quite frankly, I wish we had have had uh, more time because I think we, we, we were delving into things that we could have brought forward that would have been better in the rule. Um, but unfortunately, we had the time constraint and um, we simply had to end the, the process we were going through um, just because of that time constraint. So. Um, you know, it just it, it it was a it was a long process, and we went through a lot of stuff. And, and my understanding, and, and and rightfully so, maybe we couldn't have, but you did ask for some more time. Is that we did talk with the attorney general's office and uh, with the senate chair at the time. Um, there was mixed feelings about whether we legally could have gone beyond the tenth of January or not. The, the 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 law that came through required us to come back by the tenth of January. Um, and it just was decided that uh, that was the deadline, and, and that's what we we shot for. And uh, it's the statute, yeah, yeah. It's in the statute. Yeah. So it, you know, so that, yeah, it, uh, it you know, the, the clock ran, and we just uh, we came up against it. Represent Represent Breen, and then Represent Welsh. I mean, Senator Breen, Represent Welsh. Thank you. Um, what, in your opinion, what would have been a sufficient amount of time to tackle this complex topic in the rules? Well, I mean, if you think about the staff, the DEP staff took probably 18 months to come up with the rule. Uh, the board uh, had basically two months. I think we probably would have needed um, an, uh, another month and a half or two months to have continued uh, the dialogue that we had. You know, it, but what happened, unfortunately, is there were things, as I mentioned, that we were talking about or wanted to maybe put in the rule, but would have required us to hold another public hearing uh, and to open up more public comments, um, and we, we couldn't do that because we didn't have the time to do that. And and had we had the time, you know, we would have we would have done that, uh, and maybe had another one or two public hearings additionally uh, to continue that uh, that dialogue. But it, it just it, it just didn't. We couldn't do it. Thanks, Representative Welsh. Yeah, well, thank you for your work. I mean, I know how much we've struggled with it, too. It's, uh, it's a very complicated and tough subject. Um, seemed to me the kind of the three or f three main issues for us certainly were pe perpetual treatment, the mining site, but also financial assurance. Could you talk a little about the thinking of the board about that subject and if you're comfortable with well, yes, we, we worked um, with the, uh, the, uh, the Department of Financial Surety here um, and talked about options available. Um, you know, you were talking about the potential of putting up multiple millions of dollars, um, and we looked to try to create multiple vehicles for uh, the financial assurance, whether it be through bonds, insurance, uh, trusts, um, and so we, we put into the rule a whole host of, of potential uh, opportunities, um, making sure that each one of those were secured by assets, and that the state of Maine was the primary beneficiary was the beneficiary of those assets, and that no bankruptcy could undo the state's uh, uh, obligation to get those. So um, we tried to be flexible. I mean, you, you, you're sitting there trying to create a rule that could could maybe go to a bald mountain or could go to a small operator. Um, and you know what you don't want to do is have a small operator in a position where they're halfway through and they, and they go bankrupt and can't complete what they're doing. Um, but you also need the, the assurances that it's going to happen. So I think we, we tried to come up with as many options available that were secure. Um, and and uh, you know, I, I think we. You know, I think we try to cover every base. Yeah, I think the big question is making sure the taxpayers of Maine and you know don't uh, get stuck with it as we have been. Absolutely, and I and, and I think we were very thing, very yeah. concerned with that as we went forward. So that's why we wanted to make sure that there was enough flexibility, uh, and that we made sure that any 
any financial entity that had an interest in it was also held responsible as well. So we didn't want you know some LLC or some other small company yeah. coming in and being able to walk away. We wanted to make sure that every entity that had any relationship with that was uh, also covered under the financial surety. So it um, doesn't mean that it could have some more strengthening, um, but we worked very diligently with the, uh, the department, uh, and, and they came up with a lot of great suggestions, and we tried to incorporate them all. Senator Breen? I've got a couple questions that I want to ask because I want to make sure I got this right. On the wet rock treatment, that was not offered up in the rules as an alternative treatment. It was offered up as a last resort treatment. Correct. correct? So there are those that have allegated that all of a sudden that became a viable treatment alternative. And in your mind, in the way you guys broke the rules, that's not true. Is that correct? Well, what we looked at is it, it, what came to us was that there are times when materials get uncovered that are so volatile that the only way to protect them or protect the environment is to keep them in water forever. Um, and so what we put in the rule was if, in fact, that is uncovered and that is the only and best method, then it could be considered by the department. But certainly, we didn't want it to ever be the first option out there. Um, and and the more that I thought about it, and, and, and it, you know, I'm concerned that you know, perpetual treatment. That would be is, perpetual treatment. Yeah, and, and that just uh, that to me is troublesome. The other uh, representative, you said that you felt that you had answered the comments that had been put forth, or the staff did. You feel you felt very strong about that, very comfortable that you did that. We we addressed as many. I mean, again, a, a lot of the comments. I mean, we had ninety some odd, and then we had ten thousand pages of comments. Most of the comments were simply f to reject the law, it, it, which obviously was not up preview, um, or to reject the rules. And we felt that. A lot of work had gone into the rules by the department staff. We had put in a lot of work. Um, we did the best we could, and we, helped, we hoped that what we brought back to this committee and to the legislature was something that could continue to be worked on uh, and refined, because you know, they aren't perfect. Um, and that's, that was our hope, that as we moved them out, that it would come to this committee and then back to the legislature with some adjustments and changes to, to tighten it up. Um, but I think a lot of work was done, a lot of effort was put forward um, by a host of people. Uh, you have a, I think you have a rule that you, that you can work with. Um, I don't think I would undo it and start all over again because I think you would almost be where you are today uh, and, and still working on a couple of tightening things. So you don't want them back again? <laughs> He's, we not can, we can He's not there. Well, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, I may get them back again. <laughs> yes, right, yeah, You're gonna get them back with another Probably capacity, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I do think that I, I do think the staff, um, and, and again, and, and I, I think the rules addressed the law as best it could. The, the law was was somewhat problematic. There wasn't a lot of direction, and, and there was some things that. Uh, um, so I think the staff did as, the best they could with it. Uh, we did. Um, I, I, I think it's great that you're having this discussion because I think. Uh, more has to be done with the rules, and I, but I don't. I wouldn't throw them out. I would work with what you have uh, and strengthen some of those areas that you think are problematic. Others will think that they're problematic and and work to try to strengthen strengthen those. Well, I just represent Welsh and then represent the Shane. I appreciate your candor about personally the things that you um, are have some discomfort with. Are there some things in the statute itself that you think need to be looked at? As you, as you worked the rules and looked at the statute? Um. Well, I, I just think that um, from, I, I think that the staff tried to work, the, the statute didn't have specific direction. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think staff had to assume some of the things that um, the law was requiring. Um, and, and so I think based on that, I think staff did um, the best they could. Um, I don't know that the statute needs any adjustment, but I think I think the rules do, um, and, I, and I think this is the process. This is the place for them to be at. 
um, with the support of, of others uh, uh, that you have had here um, to continue this vital work and, and hopefully at the end of the day put some better definitions and some better um, requirements in the rule that, uh, that strengthen it. Um, and uh, I, I think I think you, you I think this is the right place for it to be. Yeah, thank you. I just comment to say if you think you were rushed doing the rules, <laughs> we were really rushed doing the statutes. So. <laughs> That's a matter of opinion. <laughs> Representative DeShane. Thank you, Senator. With regard to pe perpetual treatment, if I can understand what the board was saying, is no applicant can come in here and propose perpetual treatment. Correct. That that permit will be denied. But if you get into a mining situation where bad stuff has been extracted and the only way to solve the situation is to do perpetual treatment and then back out, close up, whatever, then that should be somehow within the rules to acknowledge. It, it, that, that's how we looked at it and that's why we put the definition in there so that if a mining operator came to the department and said we've got a problem and, and this is what we've got and this is what we think is the best way to do it and if the staff looked at it and said you know that is the best then they had that option um, you know I, I think that as I look back at it and, and listening to some of the geologists um, I think with the test borings and stuff today's technology you will know what's there yeah. so I don't think I think if they find that mm -hmm. I think it would be prudent to say it's there don't go there um, so I think that's really why in my own feeling is I, I would not want to see a perpetual treatment uh, any place here in the state. And so my own thought was, if you find it, don't go after it. And so I, I, that's why, to me, I would, I would probably remove it. Thank you for coming today. Sure. Um, when the board was considering these regulations, uh, did the board have in front of it any of the reports that were developed by uh, Bolden Resources in the early 1990s by their experts or by the experts for Black Hawk Mining who did an analysis in the late 1990s. Were those reports in front of you at the time? We, we had a large number of um, reports for different operations. Um, what we tried to stay clear of was developing rule, the rules based on a particular mining operation. A lot of the people that came to us were opposed to Bald Mountain and wanted to address Bald Mountain. Um, and we stayed clear of that because our objective was to create rules that, that answered the law. And the law was for any mining operation, metallic mining operation throughout the state. Um, and so while we had these reports um, that were developed for different areas, we tried not to concentrate on those. Um, because they were more specific to an operation and we were trying to look more generally at a rule to address a law. Good. Follow-up, sir? You're all set? Well, follow up Go ahead, please. We, um, got, we got them. Take advantage. So you, so you had the reports, but you just felt that they were misdirected because they were too specific. Well, it, it didn't help in our discussion of how to develop rules that go to to answer how to implement a law, and that's what we were for. That's what we were tasked with doing. Um, now, if the law if the law had to come through and said, you know, create rules for Bald Mountain um, or for whatever site, um, then we probably we would have really looked specifically at reports that were developed for specific operations or specific sites. Um, but we would we would focus more generally on a rule that addressed the law, and that's okay. The, so you, in fact, you did have them. Thank you, Representative Welsh. Just along in that vein, though, do you think that we should be looking at varieties of situations that we may have in the state and have different rules that may apply to the different types? I mean, we've seen um, the map of the different types of. Well, stuff, sediment we have in the state. I, I think the rules as developed tried to allow as much flexibility within the rules for staff to go whatever direction they needed to go in. Um, depending upon, again, whether it was an open pit mine, an underground mine, whether they're going after certain, the, the rules give the staff, give the department 
the flexibility to move in whatever direction they needed to move in. And that's what we were trying to create. Um, we didn't want to we didn't want to head staff down one, one, one road. We wanted to give the flexibility so that as they looked at an operation, they could develop their own um, sense of where they needed to go, what information they needed, you know. And so that's how we tried to develop the rule as we looked at it. Representative Martin and then Senator Breen. Thank you for coming in. Yeah, it's sure. great to see you in this location rather than the other. <laughs> uh, going, when, we, when I started talking about putting in the bill for mining, the question was, we put in a bill to deal with Ball Mountain, period. And the discussion that came back was, no, we need to deal with a mining law. And that the specifics of any mine that gets to be, that, that someone wants to develop a mine, the specifics of what has to be for that mine really lies with DEP. Right. And I think that's the position the board took when you started moving in that direction. Absolutely. That's that's how we looked at it. We looked at it as metallic mineral mining any place in the state of Maine and rules that would direct the department to go in whatever direction they felt they needed to go in to assure that operation was going to be environmentally sound. That's how we tried to develop That's it. how you, you moved in that direction. Yep. Yep. And, and I will say for the, because I know the town manager that was <laughs> that was with you, uh, the amount of time that, that was spent for, for citizens who were getting nothing for their service uh, was amazing to me, uh, even though I was from away uh, watching you. Uh, the amount of time that was spent was unbelievable, in my, in my opinion. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons, as a side, whether or not at some point we should not look at a, at a board that is professional, like the PUC, if we're going to move you know, in terms of established rules and that process, because, you know, I mean, I don't know how you all did it. I mean, they maintained the job. Well, I, yeah, and I do, you know, I, and I would give a lot of credit to the board uh, and to the staff. I mean, even the even the, the, the paid staff for the DP and our staff, I mean, they, they put in a lot of hours, weekends, Thanksgiving, as I said, and, um, simply because we were dedicated to the process and getting it done, um, and um, and we did take it serious. It was not a, you know, it wasn't a haphazard process at all. It, uh, um, as I said, you know, if if I could have brought, we had two boxes of materials this big. Um, my basis statement is there, which is about 300 pages long, um, which you know I, I got maybe 24 hours before we had to take a vote and spent most of that night and into the early morning reading or trying to go through it. So um, it, it, it was a dedicated uh, effort. Um, but when you get to things that are this, I, I think what we did is we came up with a good general rule. I think what you're going through now is really the next step in trying to develop that rule to be, this is a complicated process as you've heard and know. Um, and so I think this is the, the next best step for this rule to come. Um, into this body and, and, and for you to make the, the final decisions on what needs to go in it. Senator Breen? Uh, John? Thank you. Um, as you probably know, I'm new here. So this question might have, the answer to my question might be in mm -hmm. materials that I haven't read yet, so I hope you forgive me if mm -hmm. it's already in there. Um, did your board and your review process consider um, limiting or uh, putting parameters around what different aspects of mining uh, were permissible? And where I'm going with this is if you um, wanted to avoid wet storage, which are um, is one of the ways, one of the common ways that tailings are stored over time. Um, did you consider not permitting milling in the, you know, as a rule so that the, the production of tailings uh, wouldn't happen in Maine and therefore the storage of them wouldn't happen in Maine? Did that, we, like we that? did We didn't, um, again, we, we looked at more of a generalized rule um, and gave the, tried to give flexibility enough to the staff the DEP staff, if they were reviewing a particular application, 
of, of, of where to go with what they needed to do. Um, we didn't envision whether an operation would have would be moving it out of state. We, we really didn't look at that. Um, what we tried to do is we tried to look at if, it, if it's going to happen, it's going to be here in the state of Maine, the tailing is going to be here, the operation is going to be there, we need to create the rules that spread it out and, and treat it here in Maine. And, and that's sort of how we looked at it. But again, we tried to build in as much flexibility as we could um, because we wanted to give the staff that opportunity to deal with whatever came before them. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This might not be a fair question because I'm not sure. Have you been here the entire time? Have you been here no, for I the entire time? No, okay. I have not. Unfortunately, with silver dead insurance. <laughs> okay. My question was just going to be um, after the benefit of listening to the geologists, um, if, you have w if there's anything you would change in the rules based on what you heard today. With There was a lot of, I heard a lot of uncertainty, and I was just wondering if but if you haven't been here all day, you might Well, I, I mean, again, I, I, I certainly think I did hear uh, Dr. Marvini's, um, and again, as I said in my testimony, you know, I would, I would remove perpetual treatment um, out of the rule. Uh, I, I mean, we created that definition for it. We put it in there. I don't think the staff initially even wanted it. Um, it was in a discussion that we had with a, a geologist um, from Maine who talked about that potential um, of, of material being uncovered that we, we thought, well, maybe that would be a good thing to put in. And again, the more I thought about it, and, and, and after the fact, um, with the testing and the borings, I think if you find it, leave it. And that's sort of how I, um, I ended up with my own thought that I, I would probably, I would, I would take that part out. Um, but I do think that, you know, the, the nice thing, and I wish, quite frankly, I wish I could have been here um, because I would have enjoyed hearing the host of information um, we, we did not, unfortunately, have that opportunity to have some of that expert um, testimony that you folks have, and I think it's great that you've had it. I think it'll help you further down the road with these, uh, these rules as you go forward with them, um, because I think that information is very important uh, to continue to develop what, what, what we have in front of us. Thanks, and I wasn't trying to put you on the spot. No, no, no. Just one clarification from this afternoon. The question you guys asked about is predictability. What we're really looking at is monitoring. So that's really what I tried to get them to answer at the end, and I think we need to clear that up because they can't predict what's going to happen, but what they can do is they can come up with great places to monitor to determine if something's happened. I do have one big question. Yep. How did you write a rule that got rid of the Clean Water Act and got <laughs> rid of the Clean Air Act? And NERPA, I really, I have a lot of people out there who want to know how you were able to do that. Well, I think if you read uh, in the beginning of the rule, it, it says that all other applicable rules and regulations, um, like the clean air, um, also are required to be addressed. I got I got represented to Shane on this weekend. <laughs> I wrote him, did you know they did that? And he wrote, they did. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? And I'm sure you'll be available to us. And, and I, I, I want to just sure. expand on what, what the group has kind of asked. You've given us some four ideas, but as you reflect some more on this, because this was a short period of time, is there anything else that you can think of? We would really appreciate that, because that helps us as we're trying to fine tune these. And, and I appreciate saying this is the right place to go to fix yeah. it now. And, and again, I think as you get into it and, and as you get into more uh, of, of work sessions, I'd, be, I'd love to come back, because um, as you can imagine, uh, as much time and effort as we put into this, you know, I, I, we live this for and my wife and family lived this for probably three solid months, um, and you, you start to uh, you start to own that sort of thing. And um, and I, I, I I'm glad that you're doing this because I think it's uh, it's vitally important um, from a state perspective. But I think if you're going to have it, I have mining. Um, you need to have good solid rules, and I think you folks uh, are in a position to do that with what we have. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> and, and, and in Senator Brakey, he's got another big committee, uh, Health and Human Services, so he's a bit bitty. He's chairing that. First oh. for a rookie out of the box. Like, oh. Lucky him. Um, 
And but anyway, I, I, you know, if, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, And we are in a unique opportunity because normally board members we don't get to really talk to. So we now have a former chair that we can really pick your brain, and I assume we're probably going to take full advantage of that. Well, I, And it's uh, good to know that you got a raise coming to the <laughs> legislature. Not much, but you got a raise.